you need to communicate from one Arduino to another, it's pretty hard to beat the NRF24L01. These things are cheap, they're very reliable, they're easy to use, they're readily available, and, um, well, they're great little things. They've got a lot of advantages if you're using them for, say, a remote control type device. Uh, I'm going to be putting one into a replacement garage door opener, for instance. I'll um, probably put up a video of that entire project because it's kind of simple and cool. But anyway, these things have a variety of advantages. They don't use a lot of power. They do use some, though, and um, the startup time is very quick. Uh, from a cold start, you can have one of these guys talking to another one in about a tenth of a second. And, um, yeah, the code's fairly straightforward. Not as easy as some, but it's fairly straightforward. The little chips on here take care of a lot of error correcting and dealing with frequencies and whatnot. And so they do a lot of work for you. Now, there's a lot of other options. We've got, for instance, Bluetooth. We could use that. It uses fewer pins. This particular one has a great pinout. These guys here have a terrible pinout. Not very breadboard friendly, so you have to put female wires onto them to make it easier to talk to them or build some kind of um, adapter. But the Bluetooth uh, uses fewer wires, but it's got a longer startup time. It's more expensive, two or three times as much. And um, But you can talk Bluetooth to Bluetooth. It's not a problem. And these have the advantage that they can talk to laptops, desktops, whatnot. Other options would be the 8266 series of chips and modules, which... Um, this one's really breadboard friendly. It's got a nice pinout on it. But these guys, from a cold start, they have to establish a connection with a router of some sort or with each other. And that can take 5-10 seconds. Their power needs are finicky, so they require more circuitry to support them. And um, they're great for many usages, but or use cases, but for just straight Arduino to Arduino, they're great. Now in the 4 or 15 megahertz range, we've got these little guys, and I wouldn't wish them on my worst enemy. The range is about that far apart. I'm barely exaggerating. I mean, even with a good antenna, they're, they're not reliable, easily interfered with, and um, you have to write a lot of code to make them reliable. Uh, they're cheap is about their only benefit, but don't buy them, don't use them. They're terrible. It's about what you'd find in a cheap remote control car from 1970. Anyway, back to these. They're, um, the code's fairly simple. They take a 3.3 volts in. Um, all the rest of the pins are 5 volt tolerant, and um, they're pretty nice. Now, I've got a transmitter and receiver. I've got a transmitter here. When I say a transmitter, they're both transceivers. But this is the controlled controlling circuit, and this is the circuit that's to be controlled. They do chat back and forth. We've got an Arduino Uno. It's connected to one of the transceivers, and the wiring of this and this are identical, and the code is nearly identical. But the UNO has an interesting capability that it puts out just that little bit of extra current that it can run this thing by itself. So when you're developing on this, if you don't put enough current into it, it just doesn't work. It's, it doesn't, you don't really know why it's not working. It doesn't give you some kind of low-power error code or anything. It just doesn't work. So if you use the UNO, it's straightforward, and I'm using a tiny little servo, so I can run that off the 5-volt rail of the UNO. Usually you run motors through some other kind of motor controller, but for a little servo like this and no load, the UNO is fine. So this is getting from 3.3, this is getting 5 volts, there's no other wiring, no resistors or anything like that. And up here we have a transmitter, or the, the controlling thing. As I say, these are going to actually talk back and forth, so they're both transmitters and receivers. And this is a Nano. Its 3.3 volt rail does not have enough power to power this. Mm -hmm. So I've added this external power source. It has 3.3 volts coming up here, and so I have the one wire running into the transceiver unit. And the rest of the wires, there's five of them, go down to the UNO. And this one also has two buttons. So we have a... Um, we have uh, a start button, which is the white one, and we have a stop button, which is the red one. So if we send bring up the servo, we hit start, and it begins sweeping back and forth between 10 and 170 degrees. Very simple bit of code. We're not trying to do anything amazing. Then we hit a stop code, and it stops. So we can start. 
we can stop. And now we'll go up to the fritzing diagram because this is a wiring mess. So we have a fritzing diagram here, which is a much simpler thing. You can see all the wires going to the nano in this case, and they are the control wires. There's five of them. Then we're getting our three volts in from this external power source, common ground, two buttons with their pull-down resistors, and a quick explanation of a pull-down resistor is basically if you don't connect this this wire here when the button's not pushed is just acting like an antenna. And if you leave it there, you're going to get weird spurious signals going into your digital pins, which means effectively, the, as far as you're concerned, if you remove this resistor, these buttons will just get pushed randomly without anyone actually pushing them. Uh, this basically draws a tiny, tiny bit out. It's a 10k resistor, so when you send power into the button, it's not really a short. Very little of the power will go this way because this is 10k. This wire at best is maybe 2k, 2 or 2 ohm resistor, and um, so the power flows through. You get a nice positive um, voltage high, and when this is here, though, it's just enough to eat the spurious signals coming in, and you get a nice voltage low. So on and off is basically, so you need this pull-down resistor. Now there's ways to force the um, Arduino to be its own pull-down resistor, but we're not doing that for this. We'll show you sort of as a side benefit if you didn't know what a pull-down resistor was about. That's what it is. And they just go into two digital pins. It's all very straightforward. So now we go to the, uh, we go to the receiver, or the controlled unit. And it's a much simpler circuit. The same five wires go into the same five pins, 9 through 13, so 9 through 13. And then one control wire for the servo, the yellow one. So the servo gets its 5 volt power. The transmitter transceiver gets its 3 volt power, 3.3, and all is good. So now outside here we have a virtual access to my laptop, which is what is connected to the transmitter. And then we have my receiver, which is connected to my desktop. So, as you can see, we were pushing the buttons. And we'll bring up a serial view so that this serial and code, as I say, are the receiver. And this is the transmitter, even though they both actually transmit and receive. So we'll hit start. And as you can see, the over here, it says the motor started, we hit stop, and the motor will stop, motor will start, motor will stop, and then I created an amusing third option, which is if you hit both buttons, um, the motor will explode, which obviously we can't really do. And we go into the code, we have a um, begin a serial interface, that's part of a requirement for this library, the RF24 library, which you can include through managing your libraries, and then you just search for and install that library if you don't already have it. And so then we establish a radio object, or instantiate the radio class, the RF24 class, create a object named radio, and then here are the codes. Now these are numbers I just made up. As long as they're unique, you can uniquely identify each transceiver because you not only will have two transceivers, but you could also have a network of many transceivers. I believe the RF24 library can handle five, but you could also have many others in, within the same, say, house talking in different ways so that um, as long as each one's uniquely identified through this hex code, it's good. So we have a send and receive, and then on the other code over here, that'll be reversed. So then here are the two pins for the two buttons. We establish a serial connection, set up the pins. Now this sets up the radio, and what this does is I've set the power to low. We could set the power to high. It will draw more power and give you more range, but you also have to have that power available. Mm. So in the case of this um, transmitter, we have um, the external power supply, so this could easily be high gives lots of range. Now this setting retries, it increases the number of retries and increases the delay between the retries. So if there's a bit of static interference, this will buy you more reliability. You could put that way high and 
might increase the reliability more. But um, then we set which pipes are going to be for reading and writing, and that's where these codes come in. And then we give the module a kick, and that's where we say start listening, even though actually in this particular case we're going to start writing first. <clears throat> so we've got four different codes. The do nothing code, the motor start code, the motor stop code, and the explode code. And this is where we set what code is going to be going out. And we set it to a default of none. Then we look at the two pins, if the pin, the white pin is going, if the red pin is going. And if both pins are pushed, we set the message code to be motor explode. And start for white, stop for red. And if no but pins are pushed, then set it to code none. And if it's not set to um, code none, we immediately are asking that. We then, so it could be any one of these other codes, we then stop the listening uh, because we're going to be writing. We then write out a the message code, which is an unsigned long, which means we have the option of 32 bits worth, uh, yeah, an unsigned long on the Arduino is 32 bits, so that's 4 billion different code options. So we control a lot of devices with that. And uh, so then if that returns a false, then we will say failed. Now you could put more error handling where you could try that over and over again or whatever your um, project calls for. And then we begin immediately listening. Now there is a little bit of a delay between here and here, so we need a delay on the other side. But We'll worry about that in a second. So then we set what time this started in micro microseconds. And then we set that there has not been a timeout. So now we wait for a while the radio has no data coming in. So this will now loop over and over and over. And we've sent out a package, and now we're waiting for something to come back. But we're only going to wait for 200,000 microseconds, which is one-fifth of a second. So these little things are pretty quick. And what we're doing is we're saying if the present time minus what time this started at is greater than 200,000, then set the timeout and break out of this while loop. Then down here, if the timeout is true, print timeout. Obviously, you, some kind of error handling, you would be a bit more robust. You might say try the sending that last message again or something, or produce some kind of flashing light saying that there's a problem. And then here we have... Um, we have, uh, if a data comes back, which is what we're expecting, we read it in, and then we just print it out. Now all the code over here is going to do is take whatever codes come in, activate, deactivate the motor or whatnot, but it also then just sends the code right back. So we could say, we could put some if statements here saying um, motor start and stop acknowledged or whatever, and verify that that's actually the code we sent. But here I'm just printing out that code, so in data is 1, 2, and here's where we made the motor expo explode, so 3. So then back here, it's the same thing. Almost all the same setup, except that we include the servo library, because we're controlling a servo. We set up the same, these numbers here have to be the same as here, so we set that up. Same codes, except we set servo pin to being 6. And then this is about the motor. Basically this code here we won't go into, but it allows the motor to sweep back and forth. And so it's the same thing here. We set up all the same power low, retries, whatnot, except this and this are reversed. Because really this is this is the other end. This is this device and this is this is um, this device and this is the other end. So then we get down to here, we attach the servo, so that just will make the motor sweep. Oops. And then we um, say, okay, the present motor code is now none. Then we wait for the radio to have data. And so it's looping round and round, and if the motor, if there's no data coming in, then we um, don't do anything. We just skip right down here to seeing if the motor global motor running variable is true, and if it is, then it keeps sweeping the motor, and if it's not, then it doesn't do anything. And then, we, um, if the message comes in, 
while there's data, and it should be pretty quick because that's just one um, packet that we're getting in, which is one unsigned long, the motor code. We put what data came in into the motor code, we read it in, we stop listening, then we write back out that um, motor code, which is where that then receives it back here, and then we act on the motor code. So if it was start, we start the motor, or we set the global motor is running to true. If it stopped, we set it to false, put out these messages as well, and then we just put out this funny message if both buttons were pushed, which is the third motor code. And of course, if a motor's exploded, presumably it's not running anymore. And then down here, as I say, we act on how this flag was set. So it's pretty straightforward. As I say, this um, this here could be, this is unsigned long, so we could have four billion if statements. Not that the Arduino could handle that much code. So now back down to here, we will look at this for a moment, and I'm getting the power right now from the USB. But since we're doing an external power source, I can go like this, I can plug into the 5 volt rail, I can plug this into V in, and I've got this hooked up to a little external battery pack that puts out a USB, and we now have motor control without having to be plugged into any device. So we're going to start, we can stop, we can start, we can stop, or start, stop. So anyway, it's all a beautiful thing with the um, these modules. They're, as I say, they're cheap, they're easy to use, the code, as you can see, is not that complicated, and um, I really like them. As I, I think I will do that video on a new garage remote and make this um, a much more interactive remote rather than just the classic push the button and toggle the direction of the door but you don't really know which way it's going and whatnot. Plus that door has no sensor on it for um, for uh, knowing if something's interrupting it so maybe I'll put a bunch of these so the door will have a sensor and it'll have a control because the control is missing. Anyway, thank you very much. This is, I think, pretty straightforward. I'll post all these fritzing diagrams and all the code. I'll comment it a little bit better to explain what's going on. And if you have any questions about this, or even other things, but if you have any questions about this, then uh, go right ahead, put them in the comments, and I usually actually respond to them. Also, uh, all the usuals, subscribe, like, that kind of stuff. It actually helps. The more people subscribe and like a video, the higher in the rankings it goes.